Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Rolling. So, now I can write down a bunch of new Maxwell's equations using this D field that, that came from that new definition. I'll rewrite the one that I just wrote down there. Divergence of the D field, the displacement field, is 4 pi rho 3. The divergence of the electric field is 4 pi rho all. Right? The, this one's still completely true. The curl of the electric field is 0. I'm not going to prove it. But there, there are circumstances that can easily be found where the curl of the D field is not equal to zero, right? So this is a bad relationship to use. All right? These, under various circumstances, might be good, useful relationships to use, but it will depend upon the details of the circumstances. So let's consider what happens at boundaries. Because whenever we want to solve for the potential in the electric field, we consider what are the boundary conditions that we've got to match, that we've got to meet them. Material 1, 2, epsilon 1, epsilon 2. Right. D2 minus D1, normal to a surface, is equal to 4 pi times the free charge density on the surface. That's actually what this thing here says. I apply Gauss's law with the, the displacement field, and I find out that it tells me the charge density of the free charge in the problem. That's simple. That's nice. Okay. The E field might sometimes come in handy. Oops. Is 4 pi times the free charge plus the bound charge. And sometimes we might not know the bound charge right off the bat. We have to work that out after we've got the polarization of the material. So that can get a little bit messy. That was my interface. Here's my note. Simple. And messy. And one more relationship. E2 cross, oops, E2 minus E1 cross N. So we're talking about the curl in the end of the electric field. Is still zero. So when we have an interface and we've got some electric field that we uh, uh, initially apply on the system. So let me put my uh, uh, material here and I apply an electric field, an external electric field to this problem. Okay. Inside, the electric field won't be what it is on the outside. And in fact, inside, the electric field is made and pointed in a different direction from what's on the outside. So, unfortunately, I drew these almost lined up, but I'll try to make them look so they're not aligned. Right? My electric field inside and outside won't be the same. Right? But here's what I know that the D field that's perpendicular to the surface is going to be continuous. Because in this problem, where I, I have a, a material and I put in an electric field, the material is not charged. If it's a neutral material, I only have bound charge. Okay? So the, uh, the D field is continuous across the surface. And the component of the electric field, so now we see that this isn't quite right here. 
the component of the electric field along the surface is going to be matched. Right, so I actually misdrew that a little bit. Right, but I just want to get you the idea that the electric field inside isn't the same as the electric field inside. And I can figure out what the relationships are by using these boundary conditions. Um, yeah. So actually, let me extend that equation there. We're not going to need this anymore. These were Maxwell's equations, and we'll come back to them when we do optics. But we can use those relationships, our, our surface, our interface boundary relationships initially. I can uh, uh, get a result or a statement from this is that in the absence of free charge, then I can write that d2 minus d1 dot n hat is equal to zero if there's no free charge. Actually, that sounds almost like right, like an oxymoron from American Express. Okay, e two minus e one cross n is equal to zero. Now we can solve some problems. I'm going to do two. One of them. And you might have detected this now uh, as something that I occasionally do. Um, uh, is quite similar to a homework problem. <coughs> homework problem's harder. Because if I tried to do the homework problem in front of you, I mess it up. All right. Um, Say hello to your old friend, the capacitor. The parallel plate capacitor. Right. I'm going to put a charge on this capacitor. Plus Q, minus Q, giving rise to a charge density of Q over A. Right? And I just put this on the capacitor plates, whether there's a dielectric in there, there or not. What I've just done is charged that capacitor up and detached the, uh, um, uh, detached the leads to the battery, and that's it. I've got that charge on that capacitor, all right? And let's say that the plates are distance D apart, and they have an area A. Um, without the dielectric in there, right, as long as this is a large parallel plate capacitor, we already know uh, what uh, everything is. I can write down and I can say that the electric field between the plates is equal to the charge density divided by the, oops, sorry. Field between the plates. Yes, I knew there had to be something else in there. It's just four pi sigma. I'm I'm sorry, I got caught up in um, MKS units, and I just wanted to put an epsilon naught in there so badly. <laughs> so the potential difference between the two plates, right, is. Uh, E times D, so it's 4 pi sigma D, potential difference. And then the capacitance is the charge stored on the plates divided by the voltage, potential difference between the two sides of the plates. And so that's Q, oh sorry, let's see, Q is sigma a over 4 pi sigma d is equal to A over 4 pi d. So in the absence of a dielectric, 
of a polarizable material in there. The capacitance is the area of the plates over four or five times the distance between the plates in, uh, in CGS units. Okay. What did I say it was? A over 4 pi d. Okay? Now I'm going to put the dielectric in there. I'm going to fill the space, but I do want to distinguish between one material and the other. Okay? What's going to happen when I fill that space is that I'm going to end up polarizing the dielectric so that I get some minus charge there and some plus charge there. And what's going to happen is that that polarization charge is going to give rise to actually a polarization field, right, which points in the opposite direction to the electric field. So the electric, initial electric field, the initial, was that big and pointed that way. That gives rise to a polarization of the material, and the result is that the final electric field is weaker. All right? But the D field doesn't change because that's only however much free charge you have. So here I can write then that D is equal to 4 pi sigma. I could have deduced this using uh, Gauss's law at one of the interfaces, but we just did it in analogy to what we knew about the field inside of, you know, between two plates with the charge density on the surface, right? And that is just the, the, this is the free charge. And so actually maybe I'll say, this is, I'll remind you that this is free, but I told you that's what I put on the plate. I haven't paid any attention to the bound charge yet. All I know is that D is equal to 4 pi sigma. But then E is equal to D over epsilon, because that was the relationship that I had before. Or writing it out is 4 pi sigma over epsilon. For all classical materials, actually all materials to which, uh, under which DC fields are applied, epsilon is greater than 1. Okay, it's only under, for those of you, that one of you, who know something about this, under very high frequency, let's say x-ray type fields, that epsilon can be less than one. It's equal to one in vacuum. All right. Except at gamma ray energies. At which point you can create electron positron pairs. Vacuum polarizes. But, all right, so then from this, I know the electric field. The potential is the field times the distance. So that's 4 pi sigma free over epsilon times d. And then coming back to the capacitance for this capacitor, the capacitance is still external charge applied. What do we put on the problem? over the voltage, which comes out to be epsilon A over 4 pi D, or epsilon C naked. All right. Then I could ask, well, what's the bound charge in this problem? Epsilon or C? Oh, well, that's an epsilon. Can't you tell? All right. What what is the bound charge density? I've got in here bound that resulted from the polarization. Right. Well, that one's easy because I have this. I know the electric field inside and outside over there. Outside, by the way, it's zero because I'm in the metal. Right. Inside, I just worked out what the field is. So I can come back to this, and knowing what the free charge was that I had in the problem, 
I can figure out what the bound charge had to have been. So the bound charge is the D field minus the E field over 4 pi, which is, if you work it out, sigma free, whatever charge density we put on the problem, times 1 minus 1 over epsilon. Sorry, these ran together. So um, the bound charge grows. The larger the dielectric constant is, the larger the bound charge is. If the dielectric constant were infinite, and by the way, it is effectively infinite in, at DC for metals, then the bound charge is equal to the free charge and the internal electric, uh, internal electric field is zero. Okay? So all of that comes together. Is the dielectric constant actually infinite? No. Uh, eventually you get to the conductivity of the material. Uh, but in DC, this is a pretty good approximation. Now you're just scratching. Okay. Um, so that's the idea of the dielectric in the capacitor. For homework, I actually gave you um, uh, two or three dielectrics stacked up inside of the capacitor. But the approach is pretty much the same. All right, the D field is constant. That's the, that's the one thing that you need to know. You only need to know the external charge in order to be able to work out what the D field is. I'm going to erase all of this now. Except that. No worries, it's all mine. So putting, putting a dielectric between the plates of a capacitor increases the capacitance by the dielectric constant of the material. And I know I keep saying dielectric constant, and occasionally I say dielectric function. The dielectric constant applies to the dielectric function at zero frequency. So at one point in the frequency spectrum. The, the polarizability of a material depends upon what frequency you're varying the electric field at. Right now we're dealing with statics. And we'll stick with statics for another three weeks or so. I guess four weeks, including the wasted week for exams. All right. Not wasted. It's important to your grade. Um, okay, what about, and you know this one was coming, I have a spherical dielectric <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. that I'm going to put in a constant, yes, uh, in a constant external electric field, all right, at great distance, Electric field, just that. All right. The potential at great distance. Oops. Is that go all by R post theta? Okay. Uh, but now we now we have to be a little bit more careful about our boundary conditions. What's going to happen here is that we're going to end up with a polarization of the material that's going to lead to bound charge. There is no free charge in this problem. Okay. And um, yes. Okay. Good. And so now I have some conditions that I want, I, I need to apply on this surface. One of them is that the D field inside the material that's perpendicular to the surface. So I'll write it. Oops. Is continuous because there's no bound charge. Okay. Second, 
is that, and I don't quite know how to write this, so I'll just write it this way. E, the electric field inside the surface, parallel to the surface, is equal to the electric field outside. Cross R. Parallel to the surface. Cross R. Yeah. Good. Thanks. All right? So those two conditions can be rewritten like this. You find n d theta evaluated at r must be equal to d phi f d theta evaluated at r. Ah, this problem has azimuthal symmetry, so I only have to worry about theta at r. Okay? So that's what this condition means. And this one means this. Epsilon out d phi out dr dr is epsilon n d phi n dr evaluated at r. Okay. I can um, now, I think I've dealt with the boundaries. I don't need to keep that up there any longer. These are, the, these are my boundary conditions, basically, for this problem. OK? I've got the fields at great distance. I probably have not found the field on the inside yet. No. Field at great distance and the boundary the, the surface, OK? And uh, the general approach is the same approach that you took, that you would have taken for your general homework problem if Ohanian hadn't given you uh, the hint about the electric field being constant on the inside. You'd write down phi out in general is minus E naught R cos beta. I lost a minus sign here. If the field points in the z direction, it's got to be the last sign there. Plus the sum L equals one zero C sub L R to the minus L plus one P sub L. Um, where I have thrown out the powers that are positive in R because uh, those are going to do something bad. Uh, no, uh, because those, uh, I, I've taken care of the asymptotic behavior here. And any other change in the field due to polarization has got to drop off going to actually drop off is 1 over r cubed. So it drops off. Okay. So outside it's got to look like that. And inside it's going to look like this. It's got to look like that. So now I've got uh, my derivative boundary conditions, right? The theta boundary condition gives me this. P zero R sine theta plus sum over all the L's from one to infinity, C sub L R minus L plus one. D by D theta of P sub L of cos theta equals sum A sub L R D L D by D theta P sub L cos theta. That was that boundary condition. That boundary condition leads to this, that 
A1 is equal to minus E0 plus C1 over R cubed. Oops, R cubed. And so we've got to match powers of R. So that's actually what we're doing here. We're, we're just looking at each term in R and saying that's got to be true for all theta. So I've got to match my powers of R on the two sides. Okay? And A sub L is equal to C sub L over R to the 2L plus 1 for L not equal to 1. Okay? That's actually, if you worked your way all the way through the, uh, the example that we did last time with the surface charge, that's the exact same uh, condition right? uh, uh, between the coefficients. Now the perpendicular condition, so now we've taken care of this one. Now we want to deal with this one. And I'll do that over here. So that condition there, I'll leave up for a little bit, yields this. Epsilon sum L equals zero to infinity L A sub L R to the L minus one P e sub L is equal to minus E zero plus theta minus sum L equals zero to infinity L plus one C sub L R to the minus L minus 2, I think. Someone can do that. That's like plus 1. Oh, yeah. That's good. Plus 2. Minus plus 2. Right. Okay. P sub. Okay. Ugh. So, A sub L for that is equal to minus L plus 1 over epsilon L R to the 2 L plus 2 for L not equal to 1. And epsilon no, A sub L equals minus E0 over epsilon minus 2 C1 over epsilon R cubed. All those equations can't simultaneously be true. Yes, Alex? Why did you change the bounds of the estimation? Why did I change what? It goes from L equals 0 to infinity. Oh. Should be 1. Uh, I ended up switching it to, oh, that's 0. That's 1. Yeah. I've got to say, I didn't like the zero. I was inclined to remove any constants. <laughs> so I, I, I think that for this particular problem, we're certainly safe making this one and that one. But let me check. So setting equals equals to one is it's effectively setting or pulling up the zero term with e naught percent data? Yeah. Throwing out the constant. Well, the, the, the zero for it. Yeah. But you're always confused because you have to put something on the constant. We're talking about this side. Over to the right. On the right side. And that side. Let me check that. All right? It, in my notes, I actually switched uh, limits, and probably I did it correctly for a good reason when I did it, and I don't remember what they were, what it was. So let me think about that. Um, the bottom line here, by the way, is that uh, you can't match all those conditions on the A sub L's and C sub L's. They can't be equal. 
for anything but L equals 1. All the others lead to uh, an, uh, an inequality that can't be balanced. So the only term that can survive this, uh, uh, this comparison, the structure of what's the relationship between A sub L's and the C sub L's. Well, that's A. A sub L. Oh. Do I have a B over here? No, C. C. <coughs> this got to be C sub L here. Oh, that's the one. No. Uh, now I'm lost. Oh, I got that one right. Okay. Then I did it again for the R term. And I should have a C sub L. Yes, I should have a C sub L in here and a C1 down there. Now, I believe that I've included all the terms. And this and that cannot simultaneously be true. Okay? So what we say is we didn't do the math wrong. Those must be zero. And so we end up with A1 is equal to minus 3 over epsilon plus 2 E0. And C1 is equal to epsilon minus 1 over epsilon plus 2 R cubed. Easier. So, potential looks like this. Phi n is minus 3 over epsilon plus 2 e0 r cos theta. Or, minus 3 over epsilon plus 2 e naught z. Or the electric field inside it is 3 over epsilon plus 2 e naught. The external field is applied. And that's always less than um, the electric field that's applied. So the electric field is inside, inside is a constant, and it's less than the field that was applied externally. Yes? For that first A sub L, should that be R to the 2L plus 2 or R to the 2L plus 1? Two. Okay. If my notes are right. All right? And the potential on the outside is the potential of the potential of the initial field plus a dipole, where the dipole moment is epsilon minus 1 over epsilon plus 2 r cubed over r squared e naught. Oh, no r squared there. r squared goes out over there. OK, so it looks like the original field plus a dipole. So the, the, the perturbation to the original field dro dro drops off as uh, 1 over r cubed. Potential drops off as 1 over r squared. Right? So what we just did there, when we applied the external electric field to the sphere, was to create a dipole. And the dipole moment depends upon the magnitude of the dielectric constant of the sphere. OK? Uh, that's it for today. Thank you.